from the man, Moses. Very remarkable man. How many of you attempted to read anything about Moses? Okay. His story is quite, quite long, but if you just stick with Genesis, um, Exodus, rather, that is sufficient for at least today's teaching. We have just 60 minutes, so we really have to run. Acts chapter 7 is a good text to examine this man called Moses. We are discussing about Moses, a servant of God. But let's hear what the New Testament believer, Stephen, says about him. In verse 20 of Acts 7, at this time, or let's start from verse 19, so that we can understand the scenario that brought about Moses' birth and survival. This man, that is Pharaoh, dealt treacherously with our people, that is the Jews, and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not leave. The word expose their babies meant that they were thrown, as it were, to hazardous environments without parental care. And verse 21, please. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took Sorry, verse 20, please. I didn't read verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter, the word father's house referred to the actual person that gave birth to him. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Notice the phrase, mighty in words, because subsequently when Moses began to say, I'm a stammerer, I cannot speak, you have to thoroughly understand. The Bible says he was mighty in words, that's what Stephen said about him. How come Moses now says, I'm a stammerer, I cannot speak? Verse 23, now when he was 40 years old, everybody say 40 years old. 40 years old. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Notice he called them his brethren. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he, was, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying who made you a ruler and judge over us when you see somebody saying don't judge me are you a judge most likely it's the person that committed the offense he say you we go back to verse 27 he who did his neighbor wrong in a proper way they're guilty now they always say are you the judge why are you judging me when you hear that phrase is guilt verse 28 do you want to kill me as you did the egyptian yesterday 29. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord, 40 years, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. You probably read the story thoroughly from Exodus chapter 3, this Sinai story, and how every other thing unfolded from there. But we are discussing Moses a servant of God. Holy Ghost, give us understanding. Let all things be clear in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses was no ordinary man. I can say that emphatically. And this is not just because of my study in this direction. If you read about Moses normally, even if you are not trying to study anything from his life, you just read about Moses you will be amazed at how a man can attain such a stature. How a man can attain such height and level and dimension and depth. A man, Moses, incredible man. You know, many New Testament saints, like I said in passing last week, seem not to appreciate these patriarchs of old. But the Bible speaks highly of these people look at for instance in revelation chapter 15 and verse 3 we are told that even in heaven the song that is being sung is the song of moses 
they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Now, this man's ministry doesn't just end on the earth. Beyond his exploits on the earth, the records of him in heaven is loud. People think that Moses is simply the opposite of Jesus. You say, Lord came by Moses, grace came by Jesus. <laughs> Moses is a remarkably great man in the books of heaven. The songs that they sing, Song of Moses and Song of the Lamb. If you, as a New Testament Christian, don't appreciate the life of Moses, I don't know who you got to appreciate. Moses was no ordinary man. In fact, by my estimation, I'm not God, but by my estimation, I would say he's the greatest Old Testament man that ever lived. He's the greatest. The things Moses did as a man, remarkable. <laughs> In Jude chapter 1, we read about Satan fighting for the dead body of Moses. It, the, it was God that actually buried him. And when he was buried, Satan wanted to fight for the, wanted to contend, wanted to collect the dead. What was it about Moses' dead body? That man was no ordinary man. You read the way the Bible describes this man, and you should come and give him his honor, give him his respect. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1 God himself says to Moses, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. There are many people who try to call themselves God, say, I'm God. I am God. I am God. This one, it was God calling the man God. Amen. Yes. I have made you a God to Pharaoh. And then I will employ Aaron as your prophet. <laughs> That's no ordinary man. Eh? That's a mighty man. That's a great man. That's a remarkable man. I can go on and on. But this man was a very interesting, intriguing personality. He was not just a man in the sense of human existence. He actually almost, or you can say, he represented a dispensation. Such that in describing God's dealings with Israel and the documentations of God towards Israel, what the Bible will use to describe all of that is Moses. So when you see Jesus says, from Moses, he's talking about not just the man Moses, but the dealings of God through the works of Moses. When we talk about the books of Moses, the first five of the Bible, many of those, or some of those things, or some of those documents were written even after his death. But all of that was still referred to as Moses. He was not just a man. He represented a timeline. We say the prophets and the law. And when we say the law, we are talking about Moses. When we say the prophet, we are talking about usually Elijah. Dominant figures. So, is someone we should really take interest to learn from. Numbers to the 12, somewhere in verse 5 and 6, you see Miriam and Aaron, they now understand. God was trying to explain to them. He God told them, you see, if there's a prophet amongst you, I will speak to him in visions and dreams. I will use parabolic sayings to explain my counsel to him. But Moses, my servant, is not in the league of ordinary prophets. I speak to him as a man speaks to his friend, face to face, mouth to mouth. Were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You see the way God speaks about this man. A man, a human being. You see the description that God accords to him. Ah. As a New Testament saints, you should take interest and say, what exactly was it about this man Moses? What was the big deal about him? Human being like us, man of like passions as it were. But so many lessons to learn from the life and the ministry of Moses. Let's go to Exodus 2 and then begin again, like we read in summarized versions from Acts chapter 7. Exodus chapter 2 begins to recount how it all started. Very interesting story. <laughs> Moses' birth and survival was divine. One of the things that makes Moses very similar to Jesus was that the same way Moses was born um, by God or sent by God to save Israel out of Egypt, Jesus was also born and sent by God to save the world from sin. Are we still together here? So, and the same way Jesus was supernaturally preserved. Because in the day when Jesus was born, Herod was going to kill every child. In fact, Herod, 
Herod attempted to and successfully killed every child in the vicinity of Jesus. But by angelic warnings, Jesus was preserved. Moses also would have been killed. He had to be supernaturally preserved. So, brief summarization of this chapter. Born, but born in a time where the Egyptian king was very jealous concerning the way Israel were mass breeding. They were, these guys were slaves, but the blessings of God were still active on them. And they were mass breeding, like just giving back to children, held these strong children. <laughs> and then Pharaoh said, if we continue like this, one day these our slaves will become our masters. So he ordered that male children should not be allowed to leave. And so when Moses was born, the Bible says in the Hebrew account, Hebrews 11, and that's why you've got to read several perspectives of the same story so they can understand the whole picture. That his parents, when they gave back to him, saw that this one is a destiny child. There was something special about him. And so instead of just exposing that child, according to the Pharaoh's commands to death, they dared to keep him. There are many Jewish, let me say, fables that claim that when Moses was born, you know when somebody is born and is born with some features that does not look like a normal child. For instance, some Jewish stories claim that as soon as he was born, Moses did not cry like other children. That was why it was possible to hide him for three months and nobody knew they were hiding a child. Moses started behaving like an adult from day one. He started eating almost adult food from day one. Started working very, very well, very early in his life. So it seems as if the parents said, what kind of a child is this? Just the same way Mary knew that what I'm carrying as Jesus is not, in, it's not an ordinary child. The parents said, there's something about this child. Something special. So they attempted to keep him. But after three months, the pressure was too much. So they said, let's, let's just see what will happen. And by faith, they put him in the water or the river. And, um, you know, he started to watch and observe what will happen as it were. Eventually, um, Pharaoh's daughter saw the child and also fell in love with the child. <laughs> Listen to me, if God is with you, even your enemy will be working for you unconsciously. Even your enemy. They will just be helping you. And they just like the child. Then they now did something that was very remarkable. They employed his mother to take care of him. They didn't know it was the mother. <laughs> they took the child and then they said, Oh, who can, who can take care of this child? It must be one of the Jewish children that were sent to death. And they say, yeah, I know one lady. She's a very good person. Let us employ. Her. It was the mother. <laughs> and so they employed the mother. I don't know how it would feel like for someone to pay my wife to take care of Perez. Ah, ah, it's your child. You are supposed to take care of the child normally, but they are now paying you <laughs> to take care of your own child. The hand of God was upon Moses from day one. From day one. And so it was in that period that Moses learned that although his foster mother, as it were, was Egyptian, his real identity was Jewish. Because his mother was taking care of him on behalf of Pharaoh's daughter. And then subsequently, now handed over the child. Says, when the child was grown, he was handed back to Pharaoh's house. But that period, that few years, with his real mother, his mother had indoctrinated him, indoctrinated him with Jewish mentality. And so, although he grew up in Pharaoh's palace, he knew, I'm a Jew. My God is Yahweh. There was a covenant struck with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, our ancestors. And so all that was in his consciousness as he grew up in Pharaoh's palace. Are we still together now? Yes, That's just to give you a background of all the dramas that began to unfold subsequently in chapter 2. And then when we get to... I'd like you to see the way Hebrews describes this because the lessons here are remarkable. I don't have time, but... I believe this is a very striking lesson. Hebrews 11 and verse 23. Moses, the servant of God. 
my faith moses when he was born was eaten three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command by faith moses when he became of age he refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures in egypt for he looked to the reward moses by reason of the lessons his mother his real mother taught him lived in pharaoh's palace still identifying with the jewish nation and that's very remarkable because i can imagine the luxury that moses had access to as somebody who was as it were from the royal lineage people already even said well he was also a contestant for the next pharaoh because after the pharaoh dies he will hand over to another pharaoh so moses must have been pampered some people believe that he was in charge of administration in egypt or even the army there's a remarkable movie titled moses and then from that movie there are very interesting lessons you can also pick up that we're not necessarily documented in scriptures but it's safe to just stay in the boundaries of scriptures well we are told that he esteemed the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures of egypt how many of you have watched the movie coming to america okay <laughs> what's his name again what's the actor there huh eddie murphy eddie murphy was royalty and then he went to america well and then he met the girl fell in love one of those stories but the interesting thing was how he as it were neglected the treasures of his royal family in trying to identify with someone he loved similar story moses was pampered in pharaoh's palace and in all honesty he could claim to be egyptian many of us lose sight of our original identity when we are exposed to small pleasure small chicken and chips like this you forget you are a christian small shawarma and ice cream the bro is kissing you everywhere moses had the luxury of the treasures of egypt yet he will never forget i'm a jew you went to kotonu just kotonu and your dressing changed I've not gone to Las Vegas, not Canada. Cotonou there. You started wearing skimpy things. You say you're on holiday. Small pleasure. You have forgotten the son of whom you are. Moses was not like that. No matter how pampered he was in Egypt, in the palace, not only in Egypt, in the palace, he never forgot. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. He was emotionally connected and attached. To the jewish nation even though they were slaves how do you as a man of the palace have an emotional connection to slaves in your own country or in that country such that when an egyptian was trying to hurt or bully a jew moses took side with the jew indoctrination is powerful amen, amen. you see this thing more shame to say that but we see this thing more in other religions than in christianity you see an islamist jihadist he goes to cambridge to school he does not forget of jihad he does not forget about jihad whether he goes to cambridge or he goes to harvard his jihad mentality is still there you see christian small promotion like this you see a muslim in cambridge versus tablik which is bia his trouser three quarter but I'm in Cambridge or in Saudi Arabia, I'm still a Muslim. You see a Christian, they change culture, they change identity. But it's indoctrination. Moses was indoctrinated. I can imagine as a child what his mother was telling him. There is a God, Yahweh, Jehovah, is the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is the only God. The indoctrination was strong such that even the palace could not stand from his soul are you listening to me yes, you will raise children you will be parents what level of indoctrination
institution will you establish in their souls so that wherever they go in the world they will not forget the son of whom they are you will not always be there with them you will not always monitor them always but if you can indoctrinate them to a point the jihadist parent does not have to think about uh, his son the indoctrination the indoctrination they learn from the mosque is it puts them on autopilot mode for life for life whether they go to america australia europe they they maintain that fundamental identity we should how much more we who have eternal life how much more we we send our children to universities they learn to become homosexuals it's a shame we send them abroad they become liberal in their thoughts and ideologies it's, it's a shame what are we teaching them at home Moses was indoctrinated thoroughly. We read on in Exodus chapter 2. One of the striking lessons here also is his first attempt to save Israel. <laughs> he saw that Israel, his own people, were suffering and he attempted to save them. He attempted to help them. There was nothing wrong with Moses' or Moses' intention to help the Jewish people. The Bible says that he expected them to understand. That's what Acts chapter 7, Stephen, who thoroughly understood the setting, said he expected them to understand that he was going to save them. The problem was that Moses was relying on human ability, human power, human strength. So, I am the son of Pharaoh. I can save you from Pharaoh. I am an Egyptian, mighty in words and deeds. All right? I know how to use fighting instruments. I'm in charge of Pharaoh's army. And so, he was quick to show his skills. Kill an Egyptian. Say, ah, I'm your savior, Superman today. Spider-Man is here, don't you worry. And unfortunately for him, the people did not accept him like that. He failed woefully. The big lesson, however, there is that God would most likely strip you of every natural reliance, human capacity, if you are going to be useful to God, it is not wrong to want to help God's purpose. But if you think that you are going to help God's purpose by the methods of the flesh, you are wrong. And many of you have learned purpose like this. They tell you, what do you like doing? What can you do? That's your purpose. Hmm. You are wrong. Peter was a fisherman. I guess he loved his job. Jesus says, you will fish, but you will not fish men. All right, you will not fish fishes. You will fish men. The ones you catch before in the sea, the ones you catch now is on the ground. This whole concept of serving God with your natural ability is not holistically accurate. Many of the things God will ask you to do, you may not think you can do them naturally. God may ask you to be a speaker when you don't even see yourself as a speaker. God may ask you to stay at the background when you are an extrovert who likes to come out and show yourself. <laughs> are you listening to me here? So, uh, Mr. Moses, you want to serve God's purpose? It's not by connection to Pharaoh. That's not the issue here. You have learned all the nook and crannies of the palace of Egypt. You know where Pharaoh used to sleep. You can go and kill him there for Israel so that they will be saved. No, 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 no. If God allows you to go in that direction, you, your natural self, the flesh, your carnal tendency will take the glory. God will strip you of everything you can boast about, everything you can rely on in the flesh, if he's really going to use you. Moses is a servant of God. So, he was very disappointed when that Jew told him, do you want to kill us the way you killed the other person? And he went back with his head down as it were. Let me go ahead here 
because of time. We'll go on to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And then what is a very remarkable part of this story, the burning bush experience. So after Moses has been stripped of natural advantage, God now begins to invite him to true service. Natural advantage. Sometimes it's the hindrance between you and discovering real purpose. Natural advantage. For 40 years, Moses was without the advantage of being Pharaoh's son, without the advantage of being in Egypt's palace, without the advantage of all the learnings and knowledge of the Egyptian. And then when he was stripped alone, in fact, what he was doing here, he was just a caturera. Moses. From palace to wilderness. 40 years he was there. No ambition, no attempt to save Israel. He still had them in mind, but he had lost the passion, as it were, and the ambition to go and be Superman. Go and save them. He had calmed down. Life had dealt hard with him. Married with two children, but he was very humble, very meek, very sober. No intention, no ambition. He was content with just being alive for 40 years. It's a dramatic turn of events because for the first 40 years, he was, as it were, in luxury, in the palace. And then the next 40 years, he was in the wilderness doing nothing. It was in that moment, God said, hey, now you are ready. I can use you. You can be my servant now. And so, a burning bush experience. Many of us have had burning bush experiences. We have to know how to respond. He saw the bush was burning, but was not consumed. He looked. He beheld. He came close. Sometimes God tries to get our attention through things like this. Some of you have been in meetings that are very supernaturally charged up. And I've always told you, if you experience some of those volatile activities tangibly in your body, they can be invitations to deeper intimacy with God. You wake up in the morning and your palms are burning hot. You cannot explain it. You know it's not sickness. It's an invitation. Go and wait on God. God, what are you saying? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to tell me? It can be a burning bush experience. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. And Moses was smart enough to turn aside, see this great sight. While the bush does not burn, verse 4, please. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, when God has gotten his attention, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. So, at this point, Moses had lost every sense of self-confidence. Look at it in verse 11, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? This is the same Moses that killed somebody <laughs> in an attempt to be savior. Now he said, who am I? I am nothing but pencil in the hand of the creator. <laughs> Life had taught him sense. <laughs> oh, the God, I'm the one. I'm your savior. I'm the one. It's not all of that. He had calmed down. Oti kule, bye. He said, who am I? To bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Sometimes when you are depending on yourself, you will not cultivate dependence on God. Yeah. There will have been no rod of Moses that parted the Red Sea. No rod of Moses that became a serpent. No rod of Moses that drew water out of the rock as it were. If this man had depended and relied only on Egyptian prowess, when he was stripped of every self-agenda, self-seeking, self-ambition, then God said, okay, you can be my servant now. Are we still together here? Okay. Exodus chapter 4. Moses continually, consistently disqualified himself. Verse 1, Moses answered and said, this is after God had told him what I want you to do. But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. He was suffering from that negative rejection experience he had. The first time he attempted to save what they told him was that, who made you a judge or leader 
over us. Some of us have not recovered from our initial rejection experience. You toasted one girl, the girl said, Me to you, you to church poor. And since then, you told yourself, I think I am not going to marry. This woman, Wala, is too much. And God has been speaking to you and said, Try again. Say, No. <laughs> What's between? Thrice shy, actually. For you, it's not twice. Maybe quadruple self. <laughs> you see, certain things can haunt us for life if you don't deal decisively with it. The man has been rejected. In his highest of states, he was rejected. How much more now in his lowest of states? Is, what if this? What are you talking about? When I was in the palace, these same people turned their back and said, I'm not going to listen to you. Who made you? Who you be? Who point you when they followed to a certain quarter? Now God says I should go back to those people. It doesn't make any meaning. You've got to recover from rejection. Rejection can be a terrible plague in your soul. You've got to be cured from it. You've got to heal from it. But the point here is this. Moses in chapter 4, you see him consistently disqualifying himself. Disqualifying himself. What if they say, the Lord has not appeared to you? Verse 2. Incredible statement by God. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? When God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He's trying to get your attention. What is that in your hand? Ask your neighbor, what is in your hand? Sometimes we believe that what qualifies us is external. Meanwhile, it is actually internal. Or rather, we believe that what qualifies us is something we need to add to our life. Meanwhile, what you need is already with you. Say, I'm not good enough for the job because I don't have this, I don't have that. But God who calls you, who chose you, who calls you his servant says, I know what you have, I know what you don't have, and I still think that you are the best person for the job. What is in your hand? You don't, many times, many times, you don't need extra skills. You don't need extra friends. You don't need extra mentors. You don't need extra anointings. You are just not using well what you already have. They're not using well. The friends you have can take you to the next level, but you are underrating them. You don't count them as anything. The relationships that you have currently is enough. To take you to where God wants you to, but you cannot understand what is in your hand. Moses have been, must have been like, I say, Pharaoh, you say, What is in my hand? So I will go to Pharaoh, like, with stick. Is Pharaoh a goat? <laughs> what is in my hand? A rod, he answered. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. The word serpent here is snake. And Moses fled from it. So Moses was afraid of his own rod. If you know what's in there inside you, fear will catch you. The kind of power, the kind of grace, what do they carry? Or you underrate yourself because one girl, no grief for you. You underrate yourself. If you know what's in there inside you, what's in the boy, what's in the cook? I should go deeper. He cast it on the ground. Do something with what you have already. Do something with it. It was an ordinary rod, so it seemed. But by divine instructions, as soon as he cast it on the ground, it became a serpent that even Moses fled from it. David, uh, Moses rather, was a wilderness man. For him to run away from a serpent, this serpent was. <laughs> no, be normal serpent. Amen. Interestingly, the next time Moses would cast down his rod for serpentine operations, <laughs> study it in the Hebrew. The next time he did it in Pharaoh's palace, the word serpent used in the Hebrew is not the same word serpent used here. That subsequently in Exodus chapter 7, I think, where he cast it out or cast it down his serpent in the midst of the Egyptians. The word serpent I was used in Exodus chapter 7 describes something like crocodile. 
One rod, they give different flavor. <laughs> it turned from today, it turned to snake. It turned from today, it turned to crocodile. Are we still together here now? Yes, the point is that what is in your hand? Moses, the servant of God. That rod was a remarkable rod. He stretched it like this to the sea. The thing went. Wow. The, at the point, it was called, that same rod was called the rod of God. They stopped calling it the rod of Moses. <laughs> it was now called the rod of God. Are you listening to me here? Yes, what is in your hand? You think I need extra, extra, extra. God says, hey, if I've chosen you, if I've called you, if I've ordained you, if I've instructed you, what you have within you is enough. Pay attention to what you already have. Stop lamenting about what you don't have. Amen. Amen. You don't have girlfriend, you have sister, praise the Lord. You don't, you don't have husband, if you have roommate, praise the Lord. Appreciate what you have. <laughs> Are you still listening to me here? But Moses, despite the overwhelming evidence, kept trying to say, I'm not qualified, I'm not qualified, I'm not qualified. Go to verse 10. But listen to me, no matter how you try to prove that you're not qualified, you cannot convince God. Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, we read in Acts 7 that Moses was mighty in words and deeds. Is that not so? Yes, sir. So, and now, original story says that Moses claimed that he was slow in speech and slow of tongue. There are many ways you can look at it, but maybe we should just look at a few possible scenarios. It's possible that the psychological trauma of leaving Egypt, being rejected, staying in the wilderness for 40 years, had made Moses lose his sense of eloquence. Have you ever been disgraced to a point where you are short of words? You try to explain yourself. Sorry. Okay. You try to explain yourself, but nothing came out. You were stammering. You have never stammered before. But the shame was, I, 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 oh, the trauma of rejection. When you were toasting, when you were toasting the babe, you were flowing. Your, your poetic lines were just on point. You were just, you know, so just fluid. And then when she said no, even to say thank you, you took two minutes. Thank, 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 thank. Thank you. Oh! <laughs> Hallelujah! Amen. The trauma of rejection is real. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened to Moses. But the point is that he kept saying, I cannot speak, I cannot talk, I am not qualified. Look at it in Exodus, same chapter and verse 13. But he said, Oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whoever else you may send. As he kept arguing, God would say, No, no, no. And then verse 13, the Bible says, He said, Please God, and they beg you, go we'll employ another person. I know people go use another person. Let me tell you this if God is calling you, if God is knocking on your door, if God is asking you to do certain things, and you are giving excuses, it is not to the disadvantage of God. It is to your own disadvantage. First, you are wasting time. Second, whatever you now recommend as the solution to the problem may and will most likely come back to haunt you. As soon as Moses said this verse, you look at the next verses, verse 14 and 15. So the hunger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Verse 15. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. Eventually, Aaron 
in the journey in the wilderness was more of a burden than a blessing honestly and it was not in the original picture Aaron was a byproduct of Moses' stubbornness God didn't have anything to do with Aaron when he was born he was not a beautiful child yes it was now Moses now everybody says there's something about this guy but Moses kept asking, I cannot, I will not, I don't know how to. So God said, okay. I won't change my mind, but since you are recommending to me the way out, let's try your method. We'll pick Aaron and he will, he will be, he will be, he will be your spokesperson. Was, you cannot face Pharaoh, you don't want to face Pharaoh. I will speak to you, you will tell Aaron, Aaron will speak to Pharaoh. Subsequently, Aaron was really... You see that uh, his attitude was not as one who was the servant of God. How did the golden calf come about? Aaron, Moses was in the, on the mountain. Aaron, Aaron. <laughs> they told Aaron, eh, we don't know where Moses is. Aaron said, not true. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> we told you, I can talk, I can talk, I can talk. See what you can do. The Bible says he gathered their earrings and their jewels and he made the golden calf. And he said, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. When Moses now came down and said, hey, you know, What have you done? He said, hey, The people wanted to worship something. So we gathered some earrings. He now said, This is what came out. Tell you the account in Exodus 30. He said, This is what came out. What do you mean, this is what came out? You made a golden calf for them. But it's not, Aaron was never in the equation. It was Moses stubbornness. I cannot, I cannot. Some of you think you are inadequate. You are saying, oh God, send me destiny help us to stretch my feet. The thing you are asking for is trouble. God said, now you are called. You ask for destiny help us. When destiny help us comes, it will become destiny destroyer. Destruction to your destiny eventually. Are you listening to me? Yes, Sometimes it's a lonely walk as a servant of God. A lonely walk. Just you. Just you. But you and God is enough. Are we still together here? Yes, Every single time God puts a demand on somebody's services, it usually feels like they are not capable. They are not good enough. Moses said, I'm not good enough. Jeremiah said, I'm a child that cannot speak. Peter said, I'm a sinner. Depart from me, Jesus. Paul says, I'm the worst of sinners. But it doesn't change God's mind. It doesn't change God's mind. There's no point arguing with God. God who created you, who knows you more than you know yourself. There's no point. Once you hear his call, once you hear his voice, once you hear his demand, there's no point arguing. You cannot change his mind. Our sufficiency is of God who has made us able. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 4 to 5. We are not sufficient to take anything of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. The word sufficiency there means our credentials. Why we are called servants of God is because God has made us so. God has called us so. Why we are called sons of God is because God has made us so. God has called us so. Revelation 1 and verse 6. He has made us kings and, and priests. He made us so. You can be arguing all you want to. He made us so. Are you listening to me here? Yeah. Let's go ahead. But the big lesson in Exodus chapter 4 is God does not require perfection. He only demands submission and surrender. We know you cannot talk. Just surrender. Just submit. We know you are afraid. Just surrender. Just submit. We know you think you are not good enough. Just surrender. Just submit. That's what God requires. Surrender and then submission. Exodus chapter 5. Moses went to Pharaoh's palace and began to initiate the conversation. Let my people go that they might serve me. But, of course, we know how the first attempt went. Pharaoh said, who is your God? What is his name? Where does he live? And then Pharaoh said, you guys are idle. The reason why you are asking to go and do worship in the wilderness because you are idle i will increase your work i'll make you sweat and toil more because you dare ask for a break you dare ask for leave 
even though you're a servant. And I said that you guys are becoming proud because you are born in children. Fiam, 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 fiam. You dare ask for leave. I will increase your work. And then he increased their work. And Israel suffered more. What is the lesson there? Sometimes your first attempt at purpose will suffer a setback. A setback that will make you wonder, did God really call me? You've been telling me, go to Pharaoh. I told you I cannot go. I told you I cannot go. Now I finally went. The effect is that instead of relief, suffering and shege was tripled. They had met with the elders of Israel that agreed Moses and Aaron. The plan was intact. They had told the Israelites that God had sent them. They had done some miracles. Put the rod on the ground. Put your hands on the armpits. All of that. Israel said, okay, fine. Truly, it's God has sent you. But when they showed up to Pharaoh's palace, Pharaoh was not impressed. And he increased their suffering. Israel began to complain. Look at it in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 21. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge. You this, you this, you this Moses. Because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put the sword in their hand to kill us. Verse 22. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it you have sent me? I want God, I told you. I told you to leave me alone. <laughs> Look at it, verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. You were promising. You will deliver them. You have seen their suffering. You, are, you, you sent me to deliver them. Since the day I spoke to Pharaoh, there has been no deliverance. The shaggy has increased. Are you listening to me? Yes, Charles and Francis Hunter, one of the greatest healing evangelists in our generation. Two of them ministered healing powerfully. They said the first ten people they prayed for died. <laughs> And God called them to minister healing. Obituary. You see, the anointing or killing the anointing. What is this? But they kept at it. Hallelujah. Amen. They continued in faith. Till they became perhaps the greatest healing couple. Their, their miracle ministry, their healing ministry was very dramatic. The, the kind of things they did, specialized in growing bones. Legs that are not equal, they will grow it out, live on camera. You can go to YouTube and check out their videos. Incredible. And yet, the first time they put that day, let them answer. Da -da 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 -da. If now you're waiting, you go do. <laughs> God, I tell you, you know the year word. Like with this rod, you say, I go be Pharaoh. <laughs> you know the year word. I beg you, <laughs> leave me. <laughs> Moses was frustrated. He said, You have not delivered your people at all. Not even one, one element of deliverance here. Verse 24. Is that the last verse? Okay, that's the last verse. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 9. We see a continuation of the conversation here. Exodus 6 and. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. So Moses was trying to tell them, God told me that he would deliver you people. And my worry, God is with us. The Bible says the children of Israel did not heed to Moses. Do you know it is possible to be sent to deliver people and those people did not heed to you? God sent you to the city of Ogomosho with the gospel of Jesus. He sent you as a deliverer. And when you got there, the first four months, nobody came to your crusade. It's possible to suffer rejection even from the very people that God sent you to. Very possible. It does not mean you are not doing the will of God. Many of us don't know how to interpret rejection well. If God sent you there, the people will come. God can send you there and the people will not come. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yes, in fact, there were prophets in Israel whose ministry was clearly outlined to them. For instance, someone like Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, God told him, I have made your head like iron. Because these people you are talking to, they are stubborn. You will speak, they will not hear. But don't be afraid of them. Continue speaking. 
but he said you will speak and they will not hear. Uh -uh. What kind of a ministry is that? How does God call you and say, I'm calling you as a voice, but they will not hear you? But I'm a voice. You don't make meaning now. <laughs> How do you say Jesus was sent as the servant of the world, yet he was crucified by the very people he was trying to save? You know, the way we define success, when the people come, when the people gather, it means that you are really of God. I'm telling you, you can be of God, and the people will not come. <laughs> are you listening to me here? So, the key lesson, however, is continuity. Moses, they rejected him at first when he tried to use the powers of the flesh. Now, again, in the power of the spirit, they still rejected him. And Pharaoh, look at what God told Moses. He said, I will send it to Pharaoh, but he will not hear you easily. I will hide him his heart. He said, first plague will happen, nothing will change. Second, he said, until the tenth plague, until the final plague. So Moses just had to continue, continue manifesting the miracles, expressing the plagues. It is faith that continues that is authentic. If you quit in faith, you cannot really see the power of it. You want to really see the power of being a servant of God, you don't get to quit. Quit ministry because it seems not to be working. The first four years of my ministry, I can say it was like hell on earth. The only thing I did, as it were, was menial jobs serving those who oversaw my ministry. Nobody gave me Bible to preach. Okay, there was another one that was very tough. All night prayer meeting, I will lead it. There was nothing that seemed like this ministry thing was something desirable. My mother called me several years and said, <laughs> ministry is not this hard now. Even me, I'm a minister. <laughs> Go and do something. Go and start something. What is it? Four and a half years, they say you are doing training. What kind of training? It's not that like they won't put Bible to teach you. Nothing. What are you doing? My father in the flesh, my physical father, who's late now, had already ordained me into ministry. And four and a half years, I was in Rema doing things that were not related to ministry. And I was very sure God wanted me to be here. But it is faith that continues, that wins. It is faith that continues. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. And I'm still continuing. Some people are saying, what are you doing in the Goma shop? The kind of oil that is on your head, you're not supposed to be here. I've had several calls from my colleagues in this same ministry. Call me and say, how about you come to London? We need a pastor there. Our church there just began again, replanted as it were last year. Say, yeah. How about you and your family? The only thing I want to, to tempt you is about you and your family. Come to London. I say, God, no, tell me that one. Okay, what of Canada? I know we had that kind of thing. Now, this is a promotion. Now, this is a promotion. Okay, God be with you. He has been with me. He will not be with me. Faith that continues. Continue. Continue in the will of God. Continue in the grace of God. To continue in the commands of God. That's real faith. Not faith looking for comfort, convenience. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. It was not easy going to Pharaoh every day say, God say you should let my people go. Pharaoh must have been like, that's what you said yesterday. The miracle you did, our own magicians too did it. Kini yato, between your God and our own. <laughs> and God told Moses that that's how it will be. You will continue speaking. It will be like this man, they put block for a year. I they target them for something. And they tried to target something. Because the intention of God was not just to get Israel out of Egypt. The intention of God was to glorify himself among the Egyptians. Yeah. That's why he deliberately did it like that. That, okay, I'm not just going to deliver my people. I'm going to show you that there's no other God. So by the time we got to the seventh or sixth plague, Moses said, ah, this is the finger of God. But we are still warming up. <laughs> We're still warming up. You don't know nothing yet. <laughs> By the time we got on the tenth plague, Moses, Pharaoh told Moses, please, this night, 
carry your people and leave and please pray for me. You know, for, for Pharaoh to ask for prayer from Moses, he must have seen that it's not just about this Moses guy is a prophet. His own God is the real God. Are you listening to me? Yes, but the key lesson here is persistence. Persistence. Just because you are in the will of God does not mean there will be no resistance. First plague, Pharaoh did not let people go. Second plague, third plague. It kept on like that. He, Moses just kept doing it. The will of God is not a calling to ease. It's a calling to possibilities. But sometimes even for the possible, it will be hard. It will be difficult. It will look as though you are not making progress. But if you are sure it's the will of God, stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. If you are just stay with it. Stay with the prophet. Stay with the utterances. Let my people go. I don't have any other someone to preach. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Hallelujah. Amen. We have 10 more minutes here. I have to really rush here. After Israel came out of Egypt, there are many leadership lessons we can learn from Moses. But I'd like you to see, I don't have time, but let's just see Exodus 14. After Israel came out of Moses, you need to really feel sad for after Israel came out of Egypt, you need to feel sad for Moses. Because uh, the way his life went, I pity the guy. Exodus 14 and verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Verse 11. Then they said to Moses, because they were, now look at the phrase, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. First leadership lesson from Moses expects to be criticized, no matter how well you do. If you're a leader in church, a leader in the body of Christ, no matter how well you do, expect to be criticized. The very people you help will criticize you. The very people you prophesy to will criticize you. The very people you pray over will criticize you. <laughs> it's part of the package. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yes, Some of you envy leadership. One day, one day, me too, I will be a pastor. <laughs> when you join and you begin to lament, I will say, welcome to the club. Because you think it's all about the holding microphone, standing in front. You have no idea the bleeding that goes on in the heart of leaders. Especially church leadership. One of the reasons why leading in church can be one of the most emotionally draining jobs is that in church you cannot fire people you know if i'm a leader in a circular organization and somebody's messing up i'm talking you are talking i just say what's your name get man please walk him out but in church you can't do that there are some people if i have my way i'll call and say why don't you change church why don't you just go? Because we are teaching you, you are not learning. We are saying do this, you don't want to do. What? what? See, there's GSA redeem. Yeah. There's SCM. What's, what's your problem? Why well, can't do that? It's volunteer service, volunteer pastor, volunteer talk too much. So that's why it's emotional. So you have to take it in and cry. So, ah, what kind of an unfortunate member is this? Leadership in churches is a whole lot. If you're a secular, just get out. Get out. You don't want to learn a bit? Go. Go to somewhere you respect. Since I'm too small to talk to you, why don't you leave? But you can't do that, so you just have to tolerate. And when the person comes to work, you will see how to smile. <laughs> but in your heart, you are saying, what kind of a person is this? Why don't you do what we teach you to do? That's chapter two. It's emotionally, I will amplify it on Sunday. It's emotionally draining. It's not 
much you can do. You just have to stay there and be. <laughs> now, what do you make do? Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Church leadership, very draining. The people will criticize you. Exodus 16. Look at this. Look at the consistency of Israel's criticism. Exodus 16 and verse 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we are died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Why are you like this? They brought you out of Egypt. When you came out, you didn't stay back home. You came out. When you came out, you said, Oh, that we are died in the land of Egypt. Why did you come out? Well, we sat by the pots of meat. Pot of meat. Say what? Pot of meat. These were slaves. <laughs> and when we ate bread to the food, for you have brought us out into this with a little statement to kill this whole assembly. They accused Moses of attempting to kill them. Huh? Israel. Verse 4. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quarter every day. By the way, what they ate by God was described as bread from heaven. In fact, in Psalms, it was described as the food of angels. Guess what Israel called it? Manna. What is the meaning of manna? What is this? These guys were ingrates. God called it, he said, I will earn bread from heaven. When they asked Israel, they said, what, this thing is called, what is it? <laughs> This bunch of folks were remarkably ingrate and critical. You could not impress them. <laughs> and there are many church people like that. There's nothing you can do. We remember when we were in CAC. <laughs> can you go back there? Who brought you here? This our church, they don't even know prayer. When we were in Mountain of Fire, who, who pray like this? Can you? Can you go and start another branch for them here? Why, why are you here? You are criticizing us. You are in a place. You are criticizing the same place. Remember the, the cucumber and the garlic we used to eat in Egypt. Why did you leave Egypt? They will force you to come out. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Many talk about like that. They will compare their pastor with, with their other pastor. That time you hear a word like this, eh? Hot word. The one you are hearing here, you think is word. It's like that. He said, We are laboring over top. Moses must have been wanting these people. So. <laughs> if you read Moses as a church member, you understand. When you become a leader, open WhatsApp group and be the admin. I say, We have a meeting by 7 o'clock. You will see people in that, who are in that meeting posting status who are not responding to your messages. You will see, you will not understand the pain. What kind of a people like this? Did they force you to join the group? No. They say, well, so you ask them question. Nobody answers 15 minutes, only one reply. And the best reply is the second admin. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Church people. Ah! <laughs> Are we still together here? Yes, Exodus 17. My time is up. Exodus 17, verse 2 to 4. Look at the consistency. There was never an account where Israel got and said, we want to do thanksgiving appreciation service for Moses. Moses, if not for you, who did God used to bring us out? Ah, Moses, we are great. There's never a time that Israel did that. Look at them again. There were the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why are they always quarrel with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? In other words, I didn't send myself. I didn't send myself. Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? Look, look how they talk. To kill us and our children and our livestock. <laughs> These guys. Verse 4. Moses cried out to the Lord. Look at now. Otis, Otis, go boy. <laughs> Look at the statement. What shall I do with this people? 
Listen to me. No matter how gentle, meek, tolerant your leader is, he has his breaking limits. You can push him to a point where it, Moses was described as the meekest man on the earth. Israel pushed him. Look at how he started talking. What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Verse 5. The Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock on Europe and will strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah. Go to verse 8. Okay. Let's see one more. What chapter is this? 17. Let me see one more case here. Because in all of this, you see how, how potent Moses's, or Moses' leadership skills were. Exodus 32. This is the last thing here. Let me run through it. Well, this was where they made golden calf. Exodus 32. Let's start from verse 7. I'd like to see the conversation carefully. Look at God's words. Look at God's choice of words. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down for your people. Now Moses was getting tired of God, of Israel. God was also getting tired of Israel. So he began to call them Moses' people. <laughs> you see that these people, <laughs> say for your people, whom you brought out of Egypt. You know me, I don't follow you. <laughs> I don't follow you, bring them out of Egypt. Now, now you bring them out. <laughs> have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people. They are indeed a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. Leave me. Free me. That my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn off against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out of, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken by to give your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm, which he said he would do. So it's, well, interestingly, no matter how pressured Moses seemed to be at this point, his heart was still full of compassion and pity for Israel. Now, even when God offered him that I will start another nation from you, the same way I started from Abraham, let me, let me, what was the word? Reboot the system. I said, well, I start afresh from you. I want a, a lineage of meek men, not stiff-necked men. That was a mighty offer. Moses will have been in the league of Abraham and will no longer say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We will say the God of Moses. And Moses said, yeah, oh God, I don't want they are your people. You brought them out, you will keep them. Now, listen to me. This describes the true heart of leadership. And it shows the true heart of intercession. Just like we spoke about Abraham last week. Many of us submit to the concept of the sovereignty of God. What God will do, God will do. You cannot change God's mind. Actually, you must learn that God invites you into intimacy so that you can even also change his mind as it were. Many of us, 
we become fatalists. We subscribe to fatal fatalism. Just what will be, will be. There's nothing I can do. God has said that he will kill the people of Israel and he will start with me. Moses went to pray. Look at the prayers said in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 14. After this, Moses still went back to God. Look at verse 14. Okay, rather, look at verse 40, rather. I don't want to continue, so let me just close this here. 40, 40, 40. Ah, sorry. Uh, maybe it's um, 33, 40. Is there a 33, 40? Okay, just give me one minute. Let me get this here. Okay, it's 30. It's 30. No, 32, 30. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will, listen, listen, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. The point was that Moses was willing to self-sacrifice his life and his work with God and probably his eternal destination. He says, blot me out of your book. That reminds me of Jesus who became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He took the bullets of God's wrath. Moses was, was willing to say, if you will not forgive them, then remove me, obliterate my name from life. For this way, you must forgive them. I believe that that was the greatest secret of Moses' miracle ministry. Compassion. It's something that Jesus worked with. Compassion for the people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Moses did not end well, as it were. That same anger that Israel provoked him continually, eventually got him. And he suffered for it. God told him, go and iron your burial clothes and hand over to Aaron. You will not enter the promised land. Moses seemingly had anger problems from the one. In anger, he killed an Egyptian. In anger, he broke the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone. In anger, he struck the rock twice. The people kept pushing him. No matter how meek your leader is, they have their breaking points. Stand to your feet. Let's pray in two, three minutes here. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. The lessons are much, but we can stop. Yeah.